A young Robert Duvall stars in Miniature. This Charles Beaumont written episode was the target of a copyright lawsuit and barely aired for decades. Is it a lost gem? Let's take a look. Charlie Parks is a 30-something-year-old man who works hard at his job, lives with his slightly overbearing mother, and is loved by his family. But there's always been something different about him. Charlie is awkward around most people and usually keeps to himself, causing him to be labeled a square peg. One day, he travels to the Burton County Museum, hoping to get lunch from their cafeteria. However, it's closed, and he's pulled along down the stairs with a tourist group, ending up in a room with a very detailed mini-model of a 19th century townhouse. The label says it's a copy of the Boston home of a Mr. and Mrs. Copley Summers. The wood doll inside represents their daughter Alice, and the whole display was carved from the house's original balcony. He soon hears music being played, and turns around to see the wood doll inside is alive. The security guard on duty is confused when Parks asks how this trick was done. No one else can see what Charlie sees. Upon returning to work late, he's fired for not fitting in at the office. With his family worried about him, his sister Myra sets her brother up on a date with one of her co-workers in hopes that some female companionship will result in Charlie finally and truly starting an adult life. His brother-in-law, Buddy, also sets him up with a job at his place of employment. Both these attempts at helping Parks fail, and he returns frequently to the museum where he watches scenes play out inside the dollhouse. The woman there is courted by a suitor who eventually attacks her maid and carries a fainted Alice up the stairs in a lustful rage. Trying to stop the assault, Charlie breaks the glass covering the display and is eventually sent to an asylum to be cured of his supposed delusions. Robert Duvall is absolutely one of the biggest stars who ever appeared on The Twilight Zone. It's crazy to think that his lone installment was only aired once and left out of syndication for decades, but because of a lawsuit, that was the case. I'm sure I've mentioned once or twice across these videos that Rod Serling and the series were targeted by many writers who sent their work into the show, erroneously complaining that their ideas were stolen. Most of these kinds of complaints compared their piece of work to a TZ script, which bore little to no resemblance. In this instance, it was a story called The Thirteenth Mannequin. From the descriptions, this idea sounded closer to the season one episode, The After Hours, which aired well before this script was ever submitted. Like many other similar situations, the case was dismissed, but for some reason, miniature was affected to a greater degree. After it first ran through CBS on February 21st, 1963, this episode wasn't seen again until the show's 25th anniversary special in 1984. For that airing, they colorized all the scenes taking place inside the dollhouse. Surprisingly, those sequences appear as an extra feature on the complete definitive collection DVD set, but not the Blu-ray release, which is super confusing. I thought pretty much all the extra features from the DVD collection were transferred over or updated for the HD discs. Apparently I was wrong. When colorized, those shots don't add a ton to the experience of the episode. It's just a cool little detail to see them try. If you've already watched this installment in its original form, and you can find it, I'd say the alternative presentation is worth checking out for fun. Those shots inside the dollhouse made miniature distinct from many other shows. When displayed from the outside perspective of the museum, each of the four rooms are rear projected with wide shots of a specially made set. Rear projection is usually easy to spot, but this was still applied well and a big positive attribute to the look of the episode. When showing the dollhouse from a closer point of view, we get a mixture of high angles and camera movements that glide from room to room smoothly. Keeping most of the angles wide helped maintain the illusion that we were watching a scene play out on a small scale. Shout out to the production team and cinematographer Robert Piddick for the execution. What takes place in those scenes is a story within itself containing no dialogue or sound effects. It comes across as a silent film with only music being heard. This made everything feel a bit eerie, yet not devoid of charm. The Alice character plays Mozart's Piano Sonata No. 11 on a miniature harpsichord, and that tune is rearranged throughout the runtime, adapted by composer Fred Steiner. Hearing Duvall whistle it was also pretty funny. <whistles> Did you hear it? We see the male suitor meeting with Alice in one scene, and everything looks fine. 
The next time he pops up, this old school mustache twirler looks like he's about to tie the girl to some train tracks, except it seems as if there's a different nefarious act about to take place. The suggestion is made but never confirmed that Alice maybe met some kind of tragic end at the hands of this guy and her spirit is trapped in the wood of the original home this display was made out of. That detail isn't the most important to the overall plot and I like how Beaumont didn't spell it out. Duvall's performance as Charlie is a quirky one. You can tell he made a big effort to create a character here. His voice, expressions, posture, body language, and overall demeanor go a long way. What do you see, mister? Oh, nothing. A man doesn't stand for four or five hours at a stretch looking at nothing. Well, I'm not breaking any rules, am I? No. Then uh, leave me alone, please. Sometimes he's a touch unsettling. There are also points where it seems he's overdoing the quiet weird guy bit, but it evens out since this story calls for such a personality. There are moments of humor mixed in with the gloomy mood that seems to follow Charlie around. He's a misfit that is directly told he doesn't fit in anywhere. One thing I really liked was how much his family was shown trying to help him. His mother is clearly a little possessive, but she does tell Charlie she wants to see him move out, meet a girl, and raise a family of his own. His sister is very type A, attempting to start him on a path to a more independent life by arranging a date that goes awry, but hey, she tries. Even his dopey brother-in-law is nice to him, putting his own neck on the line, trying to get Parks a job on multiple occasions. But these acts of kindness do little to help Charlie feel less like an outsider. He mostly just wants to be left alone, which is why he forms a one-way bond with Alice that grows into more of an infatuation. I guess you're about to prettiest girl in the whole world. I don't mind saying that because I know you can't hear me. But I think I'd say it even if you could. The returning actors from this one were Chet Stratton, John McLeam in a solid role as the security guard, and a pair of players from big past episodes, William Wyndham and Barney Phillips. Wyndham is unrecognizable without his mustache from Five Characters in Search of an Exit. He plays Charlie's psychiatrist, Dr. Wallman, and is fine in the role, but it's not much compared to his previous work. Phillips portrayed Parks' boss, V.E. Diamel. This was also his least interesting part, but it was just nice to see him. This was his last of four appearances, the most memorable being his role in Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up. Making his one and only trip into the zone was director Walter E. Grauman. He was mostly a TV director with dozens of credits, and his contributions to this shouldn't be overlooked. Everything about his shot compositions and the way he depicted Charlie's plight was effective from a visual standpoint. There are a lot of subtle anxiety-inducing moments that you can feel in how he framed these angles. After initially resisting, Charlie completes his program at the asylum and is allowed to go home, healed of his mental health crisis. Parks is saying all the right things and performing all the right actions, but the evening he returns to his mother's house, he escapes his room and heads back to the museum. He's revealed to be hiding out after the facility was closed for the night. Charlie's family calls his psychiatrist, Dr. Wallman, who leads everyone to the museum, on to his patient's game. Meanwhile, Charlie has been talking at the melancholy Alice, who looks distressed. When his family shows up with a security guard and a cop, Charlie is nowhere to be found. But the guard soon spots something strange in the dollhouse display. It's Charlie and Alice enjoying each other's company in a live action scene playing out in front of the onlooker. Knowing no one would believe him, the narrator says the guard never told anyone what he saw, and Parks was never found ending our story. I like that finish, but I think it's a little weird that the guard smiles at Charlie and Alice like that. In my opinion, it should have been an ambiguous feeling finale where the audience decides if Charlie ending up in the dollhouse is a good or bad thing. The good side is pretty plain to see. He's with someone who he thinks understands him while serving a similar purpose to Alice. But he never figured out the real world. Parks leaves his loving family completely behind and gives up trying to find his natural place in society. He's basically living with a ghost who doesn't talk. So you can view it through a positive or negative lens for the character. The hour-long format wasn't an issue here, and the pacing rolled along nicely. It's one of Beaumont's more intriguing premises that doesn't have all of his usual dark undertones. Give it a view for Duvall's performance and how they handled the dollhouse scenes. 
Ultimately, it's a bizarre love story that fits perfectly inside the Twilight Zone. I love you, Alice. I love you. I love you.